Welcome to Talking Jazz. My guests today are Ken Kimmery and Marty Ashby. We are talking about the Smithsonian Masterworks Orchestra and specifically Jazz Masterworks Orchestra and specifically about a new release, a Bernstein reimagined release. The group is quite dear to my heart. I saw the beginnings. I was a doctoral student at IU when, when David Baker on the initiative of John Hassey gathered some of the students and started this. And I know, Ken, you were there from the beginning too. Give us a quick synopsis on what the Jazz Masterworks Orchestra is all about. I actually, I came in just slightly after the orchestra kicked off. I came in the 93 season and it, its first season was 1991. The, the orchestra itself was birthed because of wonderful congressional representative by the name of John Congers. Congers ended up seeing, and of course there's other people behind the scenes also, I know everybody worked on this, saw that the need to be able to take this Ellington collection that's in the museum and bring it to life and how better to do it, but to have a, an in-residence orchestra at the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. So federal funding came in to kick it off, and then in 1991 was the first season. Now, interestingly enough, David was courted to come and be the sole director, artistic director of the orchestra, but he felt compelled that he wanted to co-conduct with Gunther Schuller, his mentor. And so it struck a deal that that was something that was workable, and that lasted up until 1996, where then Gunther left. David took over sole ownership of the artistic direction of the orchestra. But it was, you know, those early days leading up to now is really just phenomenal in the sense of the music that was played, the musicians that were part of it, anywhere from Britt Woodman, who was lead trombotist with Ellington, you had Sir Roland Hanna, Peter Betts, Rufus Reed, I mean, on and on and on. So it was like a who's who. And at the same point, we started to learn and cultivate musicians in the Washington region, found really stellar musicians that could also raise up the level, the charge of being able to play this music in the way that we envision it to be played. Over the years, like any band, it goes through somewhat of evolution there. Its earlier days was looked more or less as a repertory ensemble, and we continued to, to push the envelopes and realize, well, that's not really fair to those masters that are still alive. Why can't we commission them to write new music and still honor the past, but also play their music now? And so we've really kind of gone through this transformational process. The biggest transformation was in 2005. We cast the full ensemble with Washington musicians, it allowed us to really work together more cohesively because of the chemistry of being in the same geographical location. It's playing together, not with just the big band, but smaller ensembles like Marty. We've done several, several times over the many years where you can take those smaller extractions and still play together. And then when you come together as a big group, a big band, you have that chemistry already locked in there. So we're not having to play 300 performances a year to maintain that. We have it because of the fact they're all in one location. So that's in a nutshell, the orchestra, there's many different twists and turns, but it's really David who came in, was courted through John Hassey, Dr. John Hassey, and then David having this vision, well, he felt strongly about sharing that artistic vision and then moving forward on his own. Where we are today is, of course, David had retired in 2013, and Charlie Young was asked, who was a professor at Howard University, asked if he would take over the artistic direction of the, the orchestra, which he did. And he had played with the orchestra for many years, so he knew the vision, but we also wanted him to put his imprint on it, not just follow what was already there in place, but really lend us his vision and help move us forward, hence where we are right now. So it's kind of a 30th anniversary, or it is a 30th anniversary this year, right? It is, and it's really strange to be in a 30th anniversary where you can't physically get together and do these things that we normally would do. It's a tough one there because I have to figure out a way to do it, but my drive is to get us all together in one room and really present us in a way that represents the orchestra and what we do there and the, the museum with, with jazz and our, you know, our continued support, promulgate, educate audiences about this unique art form jazz. So we'll figure out a way, but it's a little bit problematic right now. It'll go. Well, we'll talk about the construct and personnel of the orchestra in, in a little bit, a little more. But I want to introduce the recording that we're going to listen to. And this first piece from the recording is the Times Square Ballet. So one important thing to know is those are not the West Side Story standard 
records and Maria that you recorded, but a bit more obscure ones that you arranged. Before we dive into the Times Square Ballet, anything you want to point out about this specific selection? It's interesting. Times Square Ballet, of course, is 1944. So you're going back to World War II. Just the story itself is a really interesting story. And Times Square Ballet is a really four, really many themes within that piece there. Times Square, the bustling Times Square, sensation of being in the subway, the glamour of New York City. It's really capturing this picture of what New York City and Times Square is all about, translating that into a piece of music. Listening to the original, what I noticed right off the bat is the clarinet part. When you listen to what was played in its original intent and versus what Scott had done with it, he added some swing to it. One can say there's some Ellingtonian, that kind of thread in there, but I think he just, bottom line, he's a clarinetist. He looked at that and put some swing to it. I kind of felt he kept the essence of what the intent was Oh man, we're swanging it. I think that's a great setup to go into it and go start swanging. I'll list the whole personnel later, but this is the Times Square Ballet, and it's arranged by Scott Silbert, who is also saxophonist and the clarinetist on, on this recording. So it makes sense he made it swinging for himself. And this is the new recording, Bernstein Reimagined, by the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
from the new recording by the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra. My guests today are Ken Kimmery, who is the executive director and drummer in the orchestra, and Marty Ashby, who is the guitarist and also oversees the Manchester Craftsman Guild and helps with the release of the album. Marty, you have a, a story about Times Square and the Hustle and Bustle. You've been in New York. That's where your story starts. So tell us all about about that. First of all, Monica, thanks. It's great to be with you and Ken and talk about this fantastic record that we were able to put together over a period of, of a couple of years and pull together some amazing arrangers and some great music. Something specific about the tune that we just heard, that was one of the pieces in the repertoire for the orchestra as over the last year and a half or two years, we were embarking on a world tour uh, that took us to several countries and uh, half a dozen states. And I can tell you, every time we played that piece, the audience went wild. I mean, we had some other kind of, you know, flag wavers that we played as part of the repertoire, but there was 
was something about the journey that that piece takes you on from the opening statement of Scott's clarinet, the different iterations and the different moods in the piece that the audience really, and I think, Ken, you would agree with this, right? That they just engaged with this piece in such a profound way. And it didn't matter if we were in Hong Kong or Beijing or San Francisco or New York. It felt like the audience really related to this uh, piece of music. You know, I, I see because it's so visual and in, in the way it portrays the different aspects of New York reminds <laughs> of the Roaring Twenties, well, you know, with the clarinet too. That's that's yeah. definitely visual in there. The next one we'll hear is The Great Lover. Both are, of those are from the On the Town musical that, of Bernstein. This one, though, is arranged by Mike Tomero and it features more of Marty's guitar on here. Tell me about the process of, of finding the arrangers, putting that together and thinking about those new approaches. Charlie Young was absolutely brilliant in pulling together all kinds of different looks at Maestro or Bernstein. But we were fortunate to have a good friend of Flavio Chamis, who was actually the maestro's assistant for the last, I believe, eight years. He traveled with him. He, he rehearsed the orchestras and then Leonard would come in and actually do the concerts. So he really knew his music inside and out. And we were able to connect Charlie and Ken with Flavio, who happens to live here in Pittsburgh, as fate would have it. Between kind of the four of us, there was a list, I think, Ken, at one time of about 40 different tunes that we were passing around, different looks from piano pieces to more operatic pieces. And Charlie really narrowed it down brilliantly. I can't say that enough. But as he started to narrow it down to these 10, it really came together. I believe six different arrangers really put their own voice in this. Wouldn't you agree, Ken? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say also with Charlie, because he comes from a classical background there. That right really had that his ear tuned towards more than jazz but classical music and he wanted to take a different path than everybody else had taken with him Bernstein's music and so with combination his desire Flavio being really brought into this discussion here with the, the four of us helped us really see a broader base of possibilities and then from that was really narrowed down to what we have now for this recording here but you know it was a, a period of time of really digesting as much of the Bernstein's music as possible and then trying to figure out how does that translate translate to the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra. And there's a lot of Bernstein's music to digest and look at. But yes, I absolutely love Selections. Great Lover is, you know, talking about the energy of New York. I mean, this definitely has the energy of New York and is moving right along. So we hear quite a bit of guitar on that. Bill Mulligan took the uh, alto solo and Scott Silbert again on the tenor sax. And this guy by the name of Ken Kimmery has got a, a, a drum solo in it as well. Just a minor little thing there. Here we go. Let's listen to The Great Lover, also from On the Town, arranged by Mike Tomero from the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra release of Bernstein Reimagined. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
that was the great lover leonard bernstein composition and this is from the smithsonian jazz masterworks orchestra new release bernstein reimagined and i'm gonna stick with my bernstein because i know that's the right way to say it many americans go with the bernstein because we'll turn it around but bernstein it is my guests today are ken kimmery and marty ashby both leaders in different roles in the smithsonian jazz masterworks orchestra we mentioned that it was founded in 91 and that was actually the year I got to IU so I saw it and I remember David picking out very selective specific students and for him this was actually everything for him was an educational opportunity he wanted his students to have this experience of recreating the materials from the past as Ken you mentioned earlier using the Ellington collection there and the materials to or make it life at that time there were several of these masterworks orchestra the jazz at Lincoln Center was found with the same intention of free creating and keeping the past alive but over those 30 years it certainly changed from recreating to creating to even bringing new things to life and I want you to to reflect a minute on this changing role and still being connected to a museum though so you know if you go back to the beginning of the birth of the orchestra and what was happening that time there weren't that many repertory jazz orchestras out there. So we had a pretty tall order there. I should say there are also some of the ghost bands are out there, but nobody really did it in the sense of looking at the breadth of the repertoire that was out there, trying to recreate it in a way that not only you play the basic band, the Ellington band, but you know, anywhere from Thad Joe Mel Lewis. I mean, really kind of catching a, a broad breadth of music there. And so for us it became obvious as, as we started to see more bands starting to perform this repertoire, the reality for us to continue to do that really didn't make sense to that degree. We still perform it, but we, you know, we're more selective about it because of really our mission was to bring it to life, but also be that conduit for other bands to start playing this music. On top of that is making music available, which is a critical one there. You know, we started publishing music and finding a way to get music, make this music available. And then other outlets that, that we see today, like eJazz Line, they now have these historic charts that are available for bands to play. The other aspect was, which is real critical, we all know you can play the notes in the page, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to make music. You really have to understand how to play that music and what it requires going to play Mary Lou Williams piece we're playing with from her earlier days it has a different vocabulary than as you you're playing her music later on same thing with Ellington so we got to pretty much the 1996 where we started to see a little bit of a transition here one was David was actually commissioned to write a piece for the 150th anniversary of the Smithsonian Institutions. I kind of cracked the door open a little bit there. In consultation with David, as we're talking about, he said, well, Sly was still writing, you have Frank Foster, you had all these incredible arrangers and composers also playing David's music. So why why couldn't we take that also as a possibility for who we are? And, and that really became that opening door and opportunity. What then propelled us even further further forward was, is now we had arrangers in the band. So looking at them, not just as incredible musicians sitting on the bandstand there, but how can we employ their talents beyond that? Scott Silbert is one of those. He was the arranger for the, the Navy band. We'd be foolish not to say, hey, great arranging, but we only want you to play saxophone and clarinet. He said, no, 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 no. So let's look at this a little differently. Those changes within the band and also just our own vision realized that we didn't have, have these shackles on of being just a repertory band and still fulfill our mission. Go back and we have authoritative voice through the collection, but we also have the confidence and the ability to look forward, look now and look forward, and don't feel like we're in any way in conflict of what our message and what our mission is. I think that's very important. And for any museum, the same thing. Of course, you're preserving the past, but you also have to find a way to share it towards a path to the future. So look at how our audiences are aging or how they're changing. What's our part there? Not just play great music, but how do we foster the growth, the continuation of this music? And so it means that if you're going to play in the mood forever, your audience is going to become smaller and smaller. If you take it and maybe rearrange it and look at it with a different lens, you might then attract an, a different audience a younger audience. But the idea is that we're also, our responsibility is to continue to figure out how to cultivate new audiences and younger audiences, which means you've got to look beyond just that narrow lens there of what you think you should be doing. And that's what we are defined early on, being this repertory ensemble. Give us more latitude to be able to think bigger, broader, and more inclusive. So that's why you take a waltz and make it a reggae tune, right? With steel pants and fender roads. Anything for us to listen to when we dive into the waltz for diversity 
Robert Cimento for orchestra. That's not a waltz anymore. Fantastic musician that joined the band for this track, uh, Victor Provost, who plays uh, pan steel drums and is an incredible musician. We added some additional percussion on it, and I think it, it really brought to life the tune in a very different way. You've never heard this piece played this way. I guarantee you that. Again, it's, it's when we played this live several times now, both here in Pittsburgh and in D.C. People really enjoyed it because they were not used to hearing this music played this way. And I think to your point, Ken, before we hear this tune about the orchestra now being able to create new music and new arrangements and really move forward, you know, having had the opportunity to work with the orchestra at MCG Jazz here in Pittsburgh for now over 20 years, because we did the DVD with the orchestra with David Baker at the helm, which was more of a historical look at these incredible arrangements from a historical perspective with David's notes in front of each tune to now taking and really making new music, new repertoire that will last for forever and engaging new audiences. What we found in not only the reviews, but where the, the album is currently being played, it's not only being played on jazz stations, but some classical stations are playing some of the music as well. So it's really diversifying the, the portfolio of fans and future patrons and concert goers for this music. So I think the project in particular is a natural iteration evolution of where the orchestra is headed. Let's listen to that with those ears to arrangement by Steve Williams of the Waltz for Divertimento for Orchestra or from the Divertimento for Orchestra. This is the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra from the new release Bernstein Reimagined that is actually released on MCG Jazz. It features on the steel pan Victor Provost additional electronics. Enjoy! <laughs>
This was the waltz from the Divertimento for Orchestra. This is from the new release by the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra, Bernstein Reimagined. And my guests today are Ken Kimmery and Marty Ashby. Marty Ashby, for example, you just heard on the guitar, Ken on the drums, and they're both leaders in the orchestra. But Marty has an even more important role. He is heading up the Manchester Craftsman Guild Jazz since decades and created a space for jazz that's really, really crucial in the whole landscape of jazz. You know, you talked about audience development and so much more. This is not just a performance space for jazz, but in the whole sense of the Manchester Craftsman Guild being social industry, creating social capital and cultural capital. You've also become a record label of some sorts and released some Grammy award-winning releases. And so in addition, this album is released on your record label. Talk a little bit about the many hats of Marty Ashby in there and the sense of putting together music and artistry and bringing it to the people and what it takes. Fortunate that I'm a Gemini to be able to wear the different hats. And, you know, we've been very fortunate. The Craftsman's Guild and the jazz program started 35 years ago. So I've been able to, you know, see so many things developed a few years after that couple of years, Jazz in Lincoln Center, and then the amazing initiative with the Smith Smithsonian and Jazz Appreciation Month and the orchestra and it's stunning the work that has been done at the jazz program at, at the American History Museum. And I've been able to watch that from the beginning develop. You know, we've seen the audiences change here in Pittsburgh. We've seen the kind of the appetite for what music we produce change, not only in the concert hall, but with our educational programs. And certainly with the recordings, you know, we started the record label now almost 25 years ago, recording the Count Basie Orchestra as our first record and done a lot of Latin music with Paquito de Rivera and Nancy Wilson, Songstress, and a lot of different big bands. It's really been an honor to work with all the musicians that we've been able to work with, with our partnership with the, with the Smithsonian and the jazz program there. That goes back over 20 years, and we've been able to do some really exciting projects with the Ella Fitzgerald tour that you may remember that we helped put together with the orchestra and then the tour I mentioned before, and just many other smaller band projects and some other things. My, my gut tells me as we come out of this crazy situation that we've all been in, and Ken hasn't been able to produce any concerts, and neither have I, and neither of you, Monica, that people are hungry. We did a questionnaire with Wolf Brown, a big consultants that probably everybody knows in the arts. What we saw in our audience were literally people saying, I want to come back today. You know, we'll mask, we'll do whatever, you know, we'll wear bags. It doesn't matter. We've got to come and hear this live music. I'm very hopeful when everybody can be safe together that our music that we love, what the Smithsonian Jazz Program represents and what we represent at MCG is going to be embraced in a way that will make the Roaring Twenties look lightweight. We'll see an incredible renaissance. We actually just did a tribute to Joni Mitchell up at the Jazz Kitchen and people were coming in and many of them were saying, this is my first time right. since a year that I'm even daring to go out of the house. And it was such a special atmosphere. You know, it makes it so much more precious of what it means and mm -hmm. what we have. Eventually, it'll be something to look forward to. It's still a okay. trek. Listen to the meditation number one from Mass, Leonard Bernstein. I hear this was actually performed for the Pope, eventually the piece commissioned for Jackie Kennedy. So there's a lot of interesting history history behind this. It's a theater piece for singers, players, and dancers. And this one arranged by Steve Williams. And I would say this is probably the most modern of all of the collection. Anything you want to add before we dive in? This was actually commissioned for the opening of the Kennedy Center in 1971. And it's kind of interesting too, thinking about, I don't know if it was part of our thought process back then, but it definitely aligns pretty strongly now because what we ended up, when we went through this process prior to actually this like the, the material, both Charlie and I were engaged in meetings at the Kennedy Center and talking about this centennial and the three cities that we're going to do some really major programming, which was New York City, Washington, D.C., and London. And going through this discovery of this music here, this one particular piece, kind of had resonance because of the fact that this goes back to the opening of the Kennedy Center. Just that, all those points of connection there, that was really quite incredible. What then was, I found in 
Steve's reinterpretation of this piece, which is really a wonderful reinterpretation. If you go to listen to the original, it's really kind of a slow ballad. It's cello featured, beautiful piece. And he took a different twist to it. It was up tempo. It breathed new life into it. And then when you hear the, the, the soloist, Marty is whizzing away on the guitar there playing this beautifully. And it just says to me that once again, that Bernstein's music is really pliable. You can use it and, and re-envision it in a different way. So you look at the historical narrative and you look at where it is today and it still has relevance today. That's a great setup. Thanks for adding that information and bringing it into the context. So let's have a listen. This is the meditation number one from Mass, Leonard Bernstein piece, reimagined on Bernstein Reimagined from the new release by the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra. Here we go.
That was meditation number one from Mass, uh, Leonard Bernstein commissioned piece for the opening of the Kennedy Center. And this is a new arrangement as featured on uh, Bernstein Reimagined by the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra. And my guests today are Ken Kimmery and Marty Ashby, uh, leaders of the group in many ways. And um, something that we talked about is, is the changing roles and the changing personnel and, you know, how Washington actually has this wealth of musicians, because, of course, you have to have the army bands and it's only the best of the best. And then you have this access to to wonderful. There's, there's a few of my my favorite ladies and they're on the leads on <laughs> on the brass and the reed instruments so um tell us a little bit about the just uh, you know a few of the personnel that let's let's pick some out and and how long they've been there and and you've been touring the world also recently i'll let you whoever wants to take the lead on that <laughs> Well, personnel wise, so some of the, the those who have been with the orchestra the longest is probably definitely Charlie Young and Tom Williams. Mm -hmm. um, Tom goes back, both of them goes back to the, the early 90s. Charlie was in those early days not as available because he also uh, plays with the Ellington Orchestra. He conducts it, he you know, plays lead alto. And so, and he's a distinguished professor at Howard University. So, very busy, busy guy. But um, he, he was finally, we kind of, broke down those barriers and got him in there. And, um, and this was probably around 90, 96. Tom was in and out and then finally settled in around 96 also, 96, 97. The rest of the band, uh, and it's gone through quite a bit of, of change over the many years, the rest of the band started to really kind of congeal around 2000. And a lot of it had to do with the fact is one is like any, any uh, performing arts organization there, 
you know, the, the economics become a factor. You know, I, I, I deal with really the broadest sense of the jazz program in, in the museum. So when it comes to the orchestra, I, I also look at the financials and the, the fundraising and sustainability. And so the sustainability meant that we had to kind of look at more inwardly in Washington. And over the years, I've kind of noticed that, there, like you said, there were incredible bands already in Washington and these, these individuals were playing in these then the premier service bands there that had all the skills. There might have been a you know missing link here and there where you needed to get a specialist like a Ken Poplowski to come in and play a Benny Goodman or you know somebody like in that capacity, but really it was self-contained. So so I, I early on had the opportunity to see Jen Krupa first engagement with the uh, Navy Commodores when she came to Washington. And it was at the American History Museum and she was in her whites, you know, they're all in, you know, I, I heard her play. And I thought, man, I, there's something about this had a spark there that made me say, okay, when that moment comes, I want to invite her and see if she, she can participate and be part of the orchestra. The same thing with uh, Liesl and Liesl's another one of those really incredible players there and just blew me away from the first note that she played we were doing a rehearsal up in the American History Museum on the third floor. And not only did she play brilliantly as a lead trumpet player, but she did it in lotus position. I've never seen anybody, you know, and, and, and she played with such command and, and I thought, wow, so here's another gem, another person in, in uh, this community that has to be part of the band. Um, I'm also mandated through once again, the, the, our congressional appropriation, but also who we are as Smithsonian is that diversity is a really important part of, of the band. The band needs to represent America. And I take that very seriously. So I'm constantly looking around and trying to figure out how can we do that in a way that serves the music and also serves the mission. And so we've been very fortunate to be able to do that because of, in Washington, you have all these incredible musicians to do that. And then Another, you know, there's so many great musicians or um, James King, who, you know, my partner and our partner in crime, you know, rhythm section. So, and James is, uh, you know, anytime we're on the bandstand, it's, it, it, for me, it's a, it's another lesson learned because he's has such roots, uh, deep roots within the music and his, his uh, career as a musician. And it just kind of goes on and on and on like that. Everybody brings something there that is so unique to them and they're, it's also a family, which is really kind of wonderful. We all find a way to work together in a way that complements each other and not at a point of tension. We also will hold each other accountable too, which is a good thing too. So I'm very fortunate to be in a situation where have that, that incredible artistry, but at the same point, we kind of like each other. We like to go on the road and hang out. That helps <laughs> because being on the road sometimes means in close quarters for a long time. But yeah, thank you for, for that overview. And, and um, so the next one is actually an example of, of this intimacy uh, between the players, because in that postlude that we're going to hear to act one, there is a very delicate soprano sax piano uh, ballad interaction that that speaks to that intimacy of that family and i can i can hear that yeah. anything else we should uh add to before we listen to the postlude mr ashby no I, I i think you just said it that this this particular piece is the the most intimate piece it really breaks it down to a piano trio mm -hmm. at one point and it really, to, to, to my ears and to a lot of people's ears around the country and reviewers, uh, it really speaks to the fact that this is a jazz record. Um, because this, this, you know, halfway through this, this sounds like a small band record um, it, that could be at the, at the Vanguard at 11 o'clock at night. Um, and that's the thing that, that makes the orchestra, as a musician that gets to play with the orchestra on occasion, not all the time, but when I do, the thing that I appreciate as a musician that has played in a lot of different big bands, um, that th this group really works together as a group and it really supports one another in a way that tries to uh, get the most out of the music, um, realize Charlie's vision for the music, because he definitely has a specific vision for each piece. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. And it's not just what's on the page. And, and that is, as we know, as musicians here, that's what makes it music and not notes. And, and the band really works very hard to realize uh, Charlie's vision. But then once, once the downbeat comes, it becomes supporting one another in a very musical way, which is very exciting. And, and I think this is a great example of that, this particular piece. Hmm. Thanks for helping us drill into that. So uh, let's listen to this intimacy in postlude to act one. And this is from A Quiet Place, which is actually a full scale opera that uh, Bernstein composed. And, and this is arranged by Mike Tomero. And again, this is the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra from their newest release, Bernstein Reimagined.
This was the postlude to Act One from uh, the Leonard Bernstein opera A Quiet Place, uh, reimagined, rearranged by Mike Tomero for the newest release from the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra, Bernstein reimagined. And my guests today are Ken Kimmery, who you heard on drums, and Marty Ashby, you heard him on guitar, but also leaders of the orchestra in many ways. And I know, Ken, your charge is mostly you're part of the museum. You're the one pulling the funds together, creating all the programs. And, and Marty um, is the one contributing from the label side, helping to get the music out there and also organizing some of the big tours uh, together. So. Last year, the orchestra was going to go to Vienna and be at the Jazz Festival, which has not happened. But how how is how are you planning ahead for for the group? What is kind of the next steps, or even even recording wise? You know, what are the next projects? Well, for the, the well orchestra right now, because we're right in the middle of, in pushing the, the Bernstein album reimagined. Uh, um, out there, we have some ideas. But I think we we uh, find ourselves so engrossed with this project here that we really get the most out of it. That those things are not on the shelf, but they're they're sitting there percolating for that moment where Marty will say, "Okay, yeah, we'll give it another shot again," you know. But um, so they're they're over the last several years, the orchestra has performed a variety of concerts that have been part of the museum's religion initiative. So it's been looking at jazz through the spiritual lens there. And we, we did uh, a program uh, in 2018 that was titled Islam and Modern Jazz. Mm -hmm. And it really, for Big Band, it really had a, a really impactful um, experience there. So the question is, will that translate on a recording? That's something we have to kind of really go through that process of discovery. But in a live setting, it really had some incredible uh, impact uh, for all of us uh, on stage and in the, in the audience. So it said to me, this might have uh, some, some possibilities in recording um, out, outlet there. But you know, it's kind of hard to see at this point. As for the band itself, you know, everybody's chomping at the bit. You know, I, I, to me, I talk with the musicians on a fairly regular basis, like all of us do. And we're all kind of figuring out, you know, the strategies of when that moment comes where we can uh, really re-engage in a way that that gets us back to where we want to be, which is in front of people and have that communion together, which uh, is really hard to do, as we know, um, through the medium that we're, we're having to deal with right now. So... I, I've been looking at various moments along the way, uh, being close, of close, of, co of course, uh, being guided by the Smithsonian Institution because they have some very strict policies about when and when, and when and how, and, and and those moments when they can happen. So it's you know it's a it's a strategy, hope, and then if it doesn't, you can kind of continue to move move that peg down the board there to figure out okay, is this the moment here? Uh, it's a Kind of playing a uh, waiting waiting game there, but not in waiting where I'm sitting around and and when the green light goes and says okay now what do we do? There's a lot of strategies and a lot of ideas, so that's where we're at right now. As for for other aspects of it, I mean, Jazz Appreciation Month is coming up in April, and so we don't stop with those other initiatives. And Jazz Appreciation Month for this year. Uh, is looking uh, at once again women in jazz because we started the initiative last year, but we didn't have the opportunity because of the pandemic. So recasting it and doing some interesting programming. Uh, the poster itself uh, has an illustration of uh, Nina Simone uh, by a high high school student at, from the Duke Ellington School for the Arts. Uh, we have then a showing of uh, of American Masters. Um, film, What It Means to Be Free, which has Nina Simone and also, you know, it's a very powerful film there. Uh, so we're continuing to look at programmatically how to do things that will allow us to have a live feel to it also, and then maybe incorporate some, some band recordings into it. So kind of the combination of both as a way to propel us forward to hopefully that moment when they finally open the doors and say, come on in, and then we can really make some music. 
We should actually point that out because Jazz Appreciation Month is something also that John Hassey uh, envisioned and started. And these posters that you mentioned is something where every year it features a specific artist and, and a specific artwork. And it's kind of collectible. So if somebody wants to have this year's posters, what would they do? You go to smithsonianjazz.org. And there actually is a sign-up sheet there. And believe it or not, I have the uh, posters at my house. So I've become also the mailman. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the little tasks we all do. That's, that's really cool. I'm, I'm going to get mine for sure. <laughs> And Marty, you've been navigating trying to lead a performing arts center. That is one of the nearly impossible tasks for a year. You guys getting ready to conquer the world back? Well, our plan right now is that we'll be off and running in the fall. Okay. Uh, we're cautiously optimistic that that's going to be the case. I've got next season all programmed, ready to go. Of course, right now you can program anybody because everybody wants to work. Um, and we do have a very robust summer plan with outdoor events, um, some things that the orchestra has done in the past at the parks and, and some other places here in Pittsburgh. Um, we've got a new partnership with the uh, Pittsburgh Playhouse, a brand new theater downtown Pittsburgh uh, that we're doing a variety of, of concerts with them, some things with the downtown partnership. They're blocking off a whole street um, and we're going to be doing a variety of jazz events with them this summer. So uh, there's no question that it's coming back and that live jazz music in Pittsburgh is going to be vibrant over the next several months in a very um, safe way. Uh, everything is going to be socially distanced. Um, and my, my hope is that come September 24th, when I have the Yellow Jackets kicking off the season, that um, they'll actually be with us and we'll be able to put 350 people together in a music hall in a safe way. Um, but as we all know, um, it's gotta be kind of one day at a time with that, but it's not an if now, I know that for sure. It's a when, so um, when that is, nobody knows right now, but uh, by this time next year, I'm pretty sure that we'll be able to all play together and uh, maybe even uh, recreate some of that tour can that, that we weren't able to do this past summer. Amen. And to find out the whole programming for MCG Jazz, people should go to? Just mcgjazz.org. And we have a brand new website. So I encourage everybody to go check it out and see all the wonderful things that are going on there. And, uh, and you'll be able to uh, uh, purchase this lovely recording we've been talking about as well. All kinds of things to find out, happenings and, and all these recordings, including several Grammy winning and nominated recordings. It's a wonderful collection. So we got one more that we get to uh, hear from this collection, which is the Symphonic Suite from On the Waterfront. So this is, we started with the Scott Silbert arrangement and we're gonna stop with the Scott Silbert arrangement. And this is actually Bernstein's only original movie score. He was not inclined to write background music for others. <laughs> His music needed to be up front. And um, anything to for people to listen to heading into this one? Well, if I may, just uh, real quick. So a couple of things. One is when we had um, envisioned this piece be part of the the entire program there we had um actually scott was not the original arranger for the piece and so he got this assignment uh a week before we actually played it we started rehearsing it and then for for a concert so when you listen to it and you get a sense of the really the, the depth and the, the intricacy of this piece there mm -hmm. he essentially wrote it in three days. He re rearranged it in three days. Uh, so it just shows once again, his immense talent as a as an arranger, but also his passion. And that's probably the biggest thing, his passion for music, for arranging, for, you know, not just jazz, but music in general. And uh, this is to me is one of those pieces there that because of that backstory, it means so much to me that he put himself uh, in that position of making it happen in that short amount of time because of who he is as a person and his dedication and commitment to um, the project and, and, and the orchestra. And the, the other thing that 
that I found to be uh, just uh, phenomenal is as you've listened to the whole piece there, but the opening opening section there, you hear this lonely trumpet, which is Tom Williams playing, which is just absolutely stunning. You know, it's so exposed, Tom plays it beautifully and it just sets the tone going forward through the whole piece there as it goes through the very various iterations there. But uh, I think in that this particular piece, that particular piece, there's a lot of virtuosic playing in it uh, and required in playing it. And it took us a while to figure it out too, because it wasn't an easy place to, piece to sit down and play. We didn't have much really to reference except for the original, but um, it took a while. That's an important point. You know, a lot of this music, you don't just pull that out of thin air. It needs to live and breathe and, and develop and it developed beautifully. So, <laughs> so this is our last selection, the symphonic suite um, from On the Waterfront, arrangement by Scott Silbert. We're going to listen to the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra from Bernstein Reimagined. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Marty, for spending time with me and sharing all these insights. It makes it so much more meaningful. My pleasure. And thank you for having us. It's been a joy to be able to, to sit down here and talk to you about this incredible project that we had many years of developing and bringing to, to life. Right. Sure. Hope to see you guys in person very soon. Absolutely. Very soon. It's a date. <laughs> Here's the symphonic suite. Enjoy.
Thank you for listening to Talking Jazz. My guests today were Ken Kimmery and Marty Ashby from the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra. Tune in for Talking Jazz every Thursday at 11 a.m. and every Monday at 7 p.m. right here on WETF 105.7 FM in South Bend, Indiana or online at wetfthejazzstation.org. Also find videos of previous shows on YouTube on the Monica Hersick channel. That's M-O-N-I-K-A-H-E-R-Z-I-G. Subscribe to get the newest updates. Thank you for listening.